This is an artificially aware original well, production. Imagine for a moment a world where good and evil were as raw and unrefined as survival itself, born in the shadows of ancient fires and silent, predatory landscapes. Self-domestication, this strange, nearly ironic phenomenon of humans taming themselves, transformed our ancestors from wandering survivalists into beings with an intricate moral compass, a trait as deeply ingrained as our instinct for survival itself. I stumbled upon this idea reading an article from The Economist titled How Humans Invented Good and Evil and May Reinvent Both. The article traced humanity's journey through trial and error, showing how moral systems have continually evolved to answer this pressing question. What does it mean to be good or to be evil? But perhaps we should ask, after all this progress, are we any closer to living by universal morals? Or are we merely swapping one kind of chaos for another? With each generation, humans continue to redefine the rules, shifting from primal instincts to structured ethics to today's ideological clash between woke and traditional values. Long before laws and rituals shackled human behavior, moral instincts emerged as survival mechanisms primal and rooted in the unpredictability of the African savanna. Picture it, small groups forced to trust each other implicitly as they roamed wild landscapes under skies that stretched from horizon to horizon. Each hunting party knew that success this week didn't guarantee success next week, that safety was a fickle thing, that banding together was the only path to survival. Over time, they learned to share whatever spoils they won from the land or each other, divvying up food not just out of compassion, but as an unspoken rule, an early flicker of what would someday be called morality. This was a fragile social web, tested daily by the whims of weather, hunger, and predators. Yet, from this brutal unpredictability, early humans planted the seeds of what we would come to see as our first experiments in good and evil loyalty and betrayal. As bands of hunter-gatherers wandered, the primal concept of us versus them crystallized, defining insiders as trustworthy and outsiders as suspect. Outside this circle was danger, other groups vying for land and resources. Our ancestors lived in a state of hypervigilance, developing an odd duality in their relationships with others. Inwardly, they were kin-focused pacifists, bound by an emerging sense of fairness. But outwardly, they were fierce competitors, ready to do whatever it took to defend their territory from threats. Warfare among these groups wasn't only about survival, it became an evolutionary incentive, amplifying traits like loyalty to one's own and suspicion of the other. So humans evolved, paradoxically, into beings capable of both selflessness and violence. In their eyes, those two weren't mutually exclusive. They were necessary counterparts, twin blades of the same survival instinct. As human groups grew and learned to coexist in larger numbers, morality became more than just survival. It became a tool. Punishments were invented as a means to enforce social norms, carving in stone what could be tolerated and what could not. The earliest forms of ritualistic punishment were anything but subtle. In caves dating back 20,000 years, paintings depict garroting ceremonies, their bloody scenes preserved for future eyes. By the time ancient Greece came along, punishments had grown into public spectacles meant to reinforce the fear of transgressing societal norms. Violators might be roasted in a hollow bronze bull, their screams echoing out through the beast's horns in a twisted orchestration of deterrence. 
These grim punishments were not about cruelty alone, but about the social order. They kept the rules visible, like scars upon the body of civilization. Centuries passed, yet the essence of judgment and morality retained its primal edge, as seen in medieval ordeals like the infamous trial by boiling water. Imagine being ordered to plunge your arm into a cauldron of bubbling liquid to prove your innocence. It was believed that God himself would save the innocent from harm. But the reality, as detailed in The Economist, was more complex. Priests, aware of the weight of public opinion, would sometimes allow innocents to escape unscathed, cooling the water just enough to spare them serious burns. It was a delicate game, an early version of social manipulation. People were not only following rules, but testing the limits of power and faith, questioning just how much control the gods or their earthly representatives really wielded. It was a spectacle, yes, but one with a message. Morality could be weaponized, flexed, and bent to serve those in authority, redefining good and evil with every trial. As the centuries rolled forward, belief systems entrenched morality within societal frameworks, intertwining faith and law until they were nearly indistinguishable. Organized religion became a powerful tool for maintaining order, a construct that reinforced what was deemed good or evil through promises of heaven or threats of hell. Rituals and public punishments no longer just held sway over individuals. They gripped entire communities, from peasants to kings. Religious leaders knew this was their chance to shape the moral compass of the masses. While kings might control lands, popes and priests controlled souls. The message was unmistakable. Morality, when enforced by divine authority, became a potent weapon in the hands of those who wielded it. And so, through fear of retribution or hope of salvation, people conformed. Morality, now more of a social construct than a natural instinct, was tailored to ensure compliance within the vast tapestry of feudal and ecclesiastical control. But as societies grew and mingled, so did the complexity of their moral codes. When humans began to gather in larger cities and trade networks expanded, moral rules had to scale up, evolving to accommodate more extensive social interactions beyond family or tribe. Ancient empires from Rome to Persia understood that to govern diverse populations, they needed to unify people under shared values, universal laws, and a code of ethics that transcended tribal loyalties. Laws were no longer just unwritten rules between kin, but contracts that demanded compliance from strangers and foreigners alike. This shift meant that the age-old question of who do we protect and from whom had a new answer. Strangers could now coexist under shared enforced norms. The Roman Empire's Code of Law, Hammurabi's Code, and other legal systems set the stage for a future where morality became something imposed not just by nature, but by institutions. It was humanity's first real experiment with a universal morality, however imperfect it may have been. One of the most seismic shifts in moral history came from the unlikely corridors of the Roman Catholic Church. By the Middle Ages, the Church began implementing reforms that would radically reshape the notion of family and personal responsibility. Before these reforms, kinship groups held the greatest loyalty, and marriages were often between cousins to keep wealth and power within the family line. But with the Church's new rules banning cousin marriage and redefining inheritance, people were encouraged to act outside the tight grip of kin loyalty. Personal responsibility began to outweigh clan loyalty, and an individualistic morality started to emerge, one that saw each person's soul as accountable to God directly, rather than to a tribal collective. This shift, subtle but profound, 
paved the way for a more individualistic world where personal guilt and shame became cornerstones of moral judgment. Over time, guilt began to replace shame as the measure of moral failure. One's internal conscience took center stage over public opinion, redefining sin on a more personal, introspective level. As kinship bonds weakened and a new social order emerged, so did the foundations of modernity. The rise of individualism sparked revolutions in commerce, politics, and science. For the first time, people began engaging in trade contracts and business arrangements that were legally binding, rather than relying on family honor or clan reputation. Participatory politics took root as individuals found their voices in larger democratic systems, while bureaucracies bloomed to create impersonal, reliable institutions that promised fairness based on rules instead of favors. And with this system came an explosion of creativity in the sciences, liberated from the dogma of religious doctrine. Morality adapted once again, shifting from obligations to kin and tribe to commitments to a society where the rule of law replaced the whims of authority. In this new world order, wealth and happiness flourished in the countries that embraced it. But this didn't come without costs. As humans grew richer, the moral challenges evolved, with new questions emerging about who deserved resources and protection. Morality spread as a global concept, albeit unevenly. The Enlightenment pushed forward the idea that ethical standards could be universal, applying not just to those within one's immediate society, but to all of humanity. Reason, rather than divine command, began to guide moral laws in the West, a radical notion that all humans could share certain inalienable rights. Nations like Norway today boast a society where 70% of people trust strangers, while other countries like Trinidad and Tobago report far lower levels of trust among strangers. But the promise of universal ethics has been met with challenges. The ideological rift between cultural groups still echoes the ancient us-versus-them divide, complicating this quest for universal standards. As society developed, humans found themselves at yet another moral crossroads, balancing newfound ideals of equality and justice with the realities of long-standing cultural divisions and ancient loyalties. The experiment of universal morality remains an unfinished project, teetering on the edge of a delicate balance between individual freedoms and collective responsibilities. Fast forward to today, and morality is once again at the forefront of public life, now playing out as a battle of ideologies on social media feeds and in protests. Today's so-called woke culture war is not just a debate over opinions, but a deep question of identity, power, and what it means to be moral in an age of global interconnectedness. People have come to see each other not just as allies or opponents, but as morally polarized beings, often deeming those who disagree as inherently evil. From activists labeling words as violence to political pundits stoking the flames of division, it seems that the age-old survival mechanism of moral tribalism is alive and well. And yet, beneath this noise, as The Economist article noted, is a world where most people are not extremists, but rather a silent majority still capable of empathy and mutual respect. What if the future of morality isn't in ideological purity, but in finding a way to reconcile the vast shared values that still connect people? After thousands of years of shaping and reshaping moral codes, humanity stands at a crucial juncture. As we glance back through the ages, from the ancient cauldrons of boiling water to the lofty promises of the Enlightenment, it's clear that humans are still very much engaged in the experiment of self-domestication, ever refining their definitions of right and wrong. The journey from witch trials to woke culture has been one of trial, error, and evolution. The path of human morality has always been winding, 
and it's unlikely that any single era will ever find the perfect moral code. The real achievement, perhaps, is the capacity to adapt, to learn, to reimagine values as society grows and the world changes. The question remains, as we move forward, will this newfound flexibility be humanity's greatest strength or its fatal flaw? So, as you scroll through the debates raging on social media and read about the latest ideological clashes in the news, ask yourself, is this really the end of the moral journey? or just another chapter in an endless book. Perhaps there is wisdom in acknowledging that humans are still experimenting and maybe even learning. The real challenge isn't deciding who's right and who's wrong, but recognizing that morality itself is, and always will be, a shared, imperfect, and evolving construct. Humanity is not finished with morality yet, and morality is not finished with humanity either. Until next time, stay curious, stay questioning, and remember, moral evolution is in your hands as much as it's in your history. Thanks for joining me on this journey. If this hit home, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts. After all, this debate belongs to all of you. Goodbye for now.